Hi everyone, welcome to this video presentation. This time we'll be talking about theories of deviance within our unit on deviance. Here we go. So the first theory of deviance is on differential association. And remember, the key for all of these is that deviance is a learned idea, according to sociologists. It's something that within each culture is different, something that there isn't one standard for what deviance is. It's what is created by society within the norms and regulations of how that society wants to function and the behaviors that go against it are what we consider to be deviance. So keep that in mind as you go through the, the, this, this uh, video presentation. Differential association it comes from Edwin Sutherland, who is a symbolic interactionist. Um, and this essentially says that we interact with many different groups of people. We receive mixed messages from the groups I learned to deviate or conform. So if you think about your life and think about the, all the different kinds of groups you're a part of, your family, your peer from peer groups, um, other kinds of groups that you're a part of. And from with each of these, we receive different understandings of what kinds of behaviors are deviant and which ones are not. And so we either look to conform or we look to deviate from what is expected of us within society. And it's our association with certain groups that will lead one to conform or deviate. So what Sutherland calls an excess of definitions, that we can define ourselves by many different groups. And in those symbols and associations that we associate with them, the strong connections we have, will mean that we're more likely to conform or deviate based on what that group tells us is going to happen. So that's what's called differential association or different associations that we um, have. Again, that, that excess of definitions. The next one we have is what's called a control theory. This is Walter Reckless, so if it helps you remember, reckless means that you're out of control. So reckless control. Again, I'm not gonna ask you to memorize it, but it just if it helps you remember what, what the theory states. This is also a um, symbolic interactionist idea. And there's two things that control us. One are our inner drives, things like our conscience, our values, beliefs, our fear of punishment, etc. And the other are the outer controls, things like people. And so the stronger that our bond is with society, the stronger our inner drives become as well. And so if you think about the way that, that this works is that the stronger the association, the symbols and the meaning that we put behind our bond with people, with the outer, it also means that our values and beliefs and our conscience are also going to be strengthened as well because of our attachment to those ideas that fit with society, our commitment to these ideals that fit with society, and our involvement with the people within our society. And so control theory states that we have these two ideas helping us determine what, what we should be doing and what we should not be doing, our inner and our outer controls. Uh, this is this labeling theory. This next theory is also a symbolic interactions theory. No one in particular really came up with it, but a lot of people attribute it to Durkheim. Remember, Emil Durkheim was the, was the sociologist who worked did a lot of work with suicide and suicide rates. And this is the idea that labels we give one another um, and the ones that are given to us by others affect our perception and our perception of others. So think of it as the symbol of being a deviant or being a burnout or being a jock or being, you know, whatever the case might be with, with, within a high school. If you're given a particular label by someone or if you label yourself in one of these categories, that is going to affect how you perceive yourself and what you, how, and what you interpret others perceiving you. Um, and this is what's known as labeling theory. And so the way it relates to deviance is if someone believes that you are a deviant person, therefore you're more likely to act in that way because you perceive others to think that you're deviant and therefore, okay, well, if people think I'm deviant, I might as well act in a deviant way. Then there's what's known as strain theory. This one's got the most complex with a lot of different parts, so we're going to take a little bit of time to focus on this one. Strain theory is a functionalist idea with, with our friend Robert Merton. And what he says is that when people do not meet societal cultural goals, they feel strain, or what's known as stress, and or more likely to act deviantly. So the question becomes, what are society's cultural goals? Things like academic success, things like wealth and power, and you know, going about it through an education. These kinds of goals are what society establishes. And the moment that we feel that we can't follow in that path, and we can't do those things, we start to feel a sense of strain or stress. And that's more likely then to cause us to act more deviantly and break away from cultural goals and norms. This idea of anime is when is what happens when people become um, unsuccessful by following the mainstream norms of society that they no longer feel obligated to abide by them. So, 
For example, if we believe that the way to success is through, is through education and hard work, if people realize that, well, that opportunity doesn't really work for me, I can't seem to find my, my way in, in, in the proper education format, and I can't seem to find my way to work hard enough to get there, I don't feel any obligation to abide by those norms, and I feel a sense of anime, or what's known as normlessness. This is anime or, or anime um, concept. When it comes to strain theory, this is a great chart that I want you to make sure that you follow in terms of understanding how this works. When it comes to strain theory, there are five different types of modes of adaptation within it. You have conformists, innovators, ritualists, retreatists, and rebels. We talk about those cultural goals. Let's start with conformists. That's most of us, regular individuals. Most of us are going to accept the cultural goals, and most of us are going to accept the institutionalized means, meaning the way in which we go about accomplishing these goals. So if a goal is wealth and power, we accept that, and we also accept the institutionalized means, things like getting an education, getting a job, working your way to the top, making money, you know, making smart decisions, stuff like that. And are you going to feel a sense of strain that leads to, to anime or just normlessness? No, because you're accepting both the cultural goals and the institutionalized means. And so, for an example, this would be regular individuals. Innovators, they accept the cultural goals, but they reject how to go about it. So they are going to feel a sense of normlessness or anime, and they're going to go about doing it a different ways. So, for example, drug dealers or a crack dealer, for that matter. They agree that their cultural goal is to make money and be successful, but they don't agree about how to go about it in the right legal way. So they're going to reject the way people normally do it and go about it their own way, but still abiding by the cultural goal. A ritualist is going to reject the cultural goal, but they accept the way that we go about doing things. So a burnt out teacher, for example. They reject the cultural goal of having to, you know, make a ton of money or being, or, you know, being super successful, but they accept that the way to make a living and the way to make a life is to continue to work hard and continue to do your thing and continue to make something of yourself the best that you can. Um, and that's a lot of burnt out teachers that you see who are more rituals who just kind of go along with the motion, but don't really seem to accept the, the way that, that society goes about, about telling you what to do, like a cultural goal of working hard at your job and um, continuing to make a success even if you don't care about it anymore. A retreatist, as it sounds, a retreat is like you kind of fall back away from something. They both reject um, the cultural goals and the institutionalized means. So alcohol or drugs, men in a monastery, any of those kinds of things, they're going to feel a sense of anomie because they reject our goals and how to go about doing them. Now, the difference between them and a rebel is that a rebel is going to reject both, but for the institutionalized means of how you go about accomplishing a goal, they're going to set new goals, but they're going to reject the way we normally do things in society and look to replace them. Whereas a retreatist is simply just going to say, okay, I don't like the way this is done, I'm going to retreat, and I'm just going to deal with it on my own. So people who are re revolutionaries, you can look at members of ISIS, for example, um, to a certain degree, um, who look at the cultural goals and institutionalized means of the West and say, uh-uh, that's not how things should be done. We're going to reject your goals. We're going to reject the way you go about doing things, and we're going to look to replace it with, it with a different style entirely. So this is what strain theory is about, these five different branches um, of adaptations and the different ways in which they go about accomplishing or not accomplishing the cultural goals and institutionalized means. Another idea here is that we've got primary versus secondary deviance. A primary deviant is someone who occasionally breaks the norms, may not even really be aware that they're breaking any norms, or being deviant in their behavior, not really part of a person's lifestyle or self-concept. College students in a study talked about how they would cheat on occasion, they would jaywalk, they'd break, you know, very, they'd break some folkways or a couple of mores, but it wasn't something that was consistently within their behavior. A secondary deviant, on the other hand, are people who identify with deviant behavior, who find it that's a piece of their lifestyle. People like career criminals, gang members, etc., where they feel that secondary deviance is really the way to go because it's a part of their lifestyle. And so make sure you really understand this difference between a primary and a secondary deviant. All right, these are all the notes we have for today. Make sure that you fill out your notes when you get this down. Feel free to fill out the interactive guide if you have any questions. Um, and I'll look forward to talking about this with you guys tomorrow. Take care. Have a great day.